Uh, this is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. I want to welcome everyone to our very first edition of our 2022 State of the Consumer webinar series. For those of you who have been with us, the OGs, if you will, for a while, you'll know that we've been doing these webinars way back uh, in uh, March 2020 when this pandemic first hit. Uh, nobody really knew uh, where this was going to take us in terms of business and culture and society. And we have all around the world, every human has gone through a wild ride. Um, some some have been memorable, some not so memorable um, throughout this uh, pandemic. And obviously, it's something that has impacted us all in a variety of different ways. Um, at Suzy, we had made the decision right when this was starting to try to be, um, you know, a voice for our community, for our customers, um, you know, for the industry at large on how this pandemic is going to impact the business world. And in doing so, have created a series of webinars about a variety of different topics that were impacting the consumer. And right now, um, here we are in Q1 of 2022, and one of the biggest issues impacting the consumer is pricing and inflation. Uh, we are right now the victim of rising costs that are happening here in the United States. And it's really a byproduct of the massive amounts of stimulus that were pumped into the economy to really prop up and hold the economy uh, by the federal government uh, during the pandemic. So there's been multiple, um, you know, ways where there's been a quantitative easing in the financial markets and fiscal stimulus to consumers putting checks in people's pockets. And the more money there is in the economy, obviously, unless supply is increasing at those same rates, you are going to have more demand than there is supply. And basic economics show that that means that you're going to have costs that are going to be rising. And we're seeing costs rising across the board. Uh, many people don't realize that in the 80s, the interest rate on a mortgage was 18%. The same amount of interest that you pay right now for your MasterCard or Visa or American Express, people were paying on their mortgage. And right now, at least as of last year, people were paying 2 or 3% on their uh, interest on their mortgage. And that um, a byproduct of that was a massive prop up of the housing market. And we're still seeing that happen. We'll get into that. So there are so many different facets to this. And what we want to try to do today is really decode this for all of you and really hopefully get into some great areas of discussion. Um, we have great guests today. For those of you who don't know who Suzy is, by the way, we are a real-time market research platform. We exist to help businesses make better, faster, more data-driven decisions. Uh, we work with the who's who of major brands across major industry sectors to power their market research to make sure that they're putting the consumer at the center of every decision they make. And now more than ever, you need to listen to consumers, especially when it comes to pricing. If you raise your pricing, what will fly with consumers? At what point will consumers not be okay with you passing on your rising costs to them? Those are things you really never know unless you ask consumers. And that's just one of many use cases, price testing that we offer um, at Suzy. Today, we're going to be going over a study, uh, which was conducted um, between the dates of December 17th and 20th with a sample size of 1,000 Americans. When we talk about Suzy's first party data, it's going to be that exact study. Samples directionally representative of U.S. consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, we're going to jump into it. As I mentioned uh, a minute ago, we are witnessing an inflation surge in the U.S., of which many consumers have not really experienced. Um, maybe if you are a older Gen Xer or baby boomer, you remember uh, the Carter administration and the rising costs we saw in the late 70s, early 80s, um, which led to a period of stagflation and really economic downturn um, in the U.S., which we didn't really start to get out of until the Reagan, uh, Reagan administration and then later the boom that we saw during the Clinton administration. Uh, which was really coupled with the dot-com boom that we saw. But it's cyclical. The economy is cyclical. And one thing that many um, younger consumers don't realize is good times don't last forever. And we are starting to see the impact of the Band-Aids that we put on the U.S. population during the pandemic. And we never really healed the wound. We never really went through the pain. And it looks like inflation is a big part of that pain that we're going to be facing as a byproduct of the pandemic's impact on the economy. In December, prices rose 7% uh, compared to a year ago. Um, and 2020, um, inflation is now reaching its highest um, inflation increase in 40 years. So, it, you know, it wasn't since the 70s that consumers have seen, um, you know, prices rise quite this quickly. Um, and again, it's rising in, in a variety of different sectors, um, you know, throughout the economy in ways that consumers both expect and don't expect. 
And there's really no end in sight to this because we got to a point where interest rates basically were at zero. So when, when, when you are bringing down interest rates to zero, there's really nowhere for them to go uh, than up. In some nations around the world, you actually had to pay a bank interest to keep your money for you. So negative interest, if you will. There was a time at the height of this pandemic where it was more expensive to store gasoline than it was to actually sell it. So people didn't want the gasoline. So this shows where we face as an economy areas and, uh, you know, we've gone to depths where we've never faced before. And that's why there's no end in sight, because we have so much more room to catch up in terms of interest rates, which is driven by the central bank and the Fed, Federal Reserve going up, which, again, has this sort of trickle down impact on making money more expensive um, and making goods more expensive, which really ultimately, re, um, you know, will generate higher prices for the end consumer. Um, so inflation emerging is one of the top economic challenges in 2022. The word inflation was not something that most U.S. consumers mentioned at all in the last 10 to 15 years. It wasn't even something that they had even thought about. So now all of a sudden, it's jumped from an, a topic that people didn't really think about to the, what they're calling the top economic challenge in 2022. 45% uh, of consumers don't really understand why prices are increasing. And that is understandable because it is a sort of a complex, um, you know, topic, you know, why all of a sudden are prices rising? Ultimately, it is a supply versus demand issue, but it's not really that simple. Um, there are supply chain issues in terms of um, how costly and difficult it's been as of late for um, goods to be imported from places like China, where goods are manufactured um, a lot more efficiently and cheaply. So, you know, U.S. consumers have long been the beneficiary of continually dropping prices. And because of that, they'd be able to access goods and services that were once considered luxurious. If you look at the Toyota Camry today and, and what is in that vehicle, which consumers can get for no money down and $200 a month, you know, this is a vehicle that if you purchased 20 years ago, it would only be reserved for the you know top 1% of consumers. Um, if you look at an iPhone and what goes into that, if an iPhone was produced in the United States versus the majority of it being produced in China, the iPhone would cost $4,000 versus $1,000. So we have long been the beneficiary of going into Walmart and being able to buy jeans or, or T-shirts for you know less than $10. These are all um, you know a, a impact and byproduct of globalization. And once you have issues with globalization and once you have, again, a rising um, uh, stimulus uh, generated environment where consumers pockets are fatter than ever, you're going to have two conflating factors that are going to drive up pricing. Um, while consumers might not get inflation, they certainly feel it. 60% uh, of consumers say that inflation is or will majorly impact their daily, daily lives, which is a major number. I mean, it really hit us quickly. Uh, I didn't think it would uh, impact the con end consumer and kind of trickle down the consumer this quickly, but it certainly has. So in this webinar, we're going to really uncover three main topics. Uh, first and foremost, how are consumers being impacted by rising prices? Two, what are their consumer spending plans for 2022? And three, what tools are consumers turning to for help? So let's talk about the consumer impact first. 65% uh, of consumers have noticed price increases on products. So that, that's a big number. You know, they're going into the store. They're looking at things that they normally purchased in the past. And all of a sudden, they're seeing a higher price tag. And it's 50 cents on one product. It's $1.50 on another product. But for, for many consumers, it's starting to really add up. And it's forcing them to make choices that in the past, they really weren't forced to make. Uh, the categories where consumers are noticing price increases most include, first and foremost, groceries. Uh, they're seeing it on their everyday grocery purchases. They are seeing it at the gas pump, and they will likely continue to see it at the gas pump. Uh, restaurants and takeout food, they're seeing increases on. And then personal care products. So we, you're talking about really everyday uh, purchases that consumers are, are making so they can drive to work or drive to school um, or they can you know, feed their family or they can take care of themselves. These are things that consumers really can't afford to live without. So as a result, they're forced to bear the brunt of this inflation and ultimately will probably come at the expense of other more discretionary purchases that consumers need to make, whether it's luxury goods, uh, whether it's travel. This, the, those are the sorts of um, sectors that could really suffer because consumers are not going to stop buying milk for their family. Maybe they'll look for cheaper brands, 
but ultimately they will stop traveling if their if their expenditures are getting eaten up by rising costs um, in the everyday items that they're purchasing. Uh, brands right now don't I wouldn't say they don't seem concerned, but they are forced to, and in many instances, take the choice to pass along price increases. Um, PepsiCo recently warned of a price increase uh, as they have supply disruptions that are lingering. Procter & Gamble recently reported that they had record earnings because they were able to pass their rising commodity prices over to the consumer. So, you know, these are companies that are selling everyday goods that are understanding that they have no choice but to pass on some of these cost increases that they're facing to their end consumer. And to date, consumers have been okay with it. But again, we are in the very early stages of this, and the, the increase in costs are really just beginning. So while maybe the, the, the price of a, of a couple of liter bottle of Pepsi maybe went up you know, 2 or 3%, it could end up going 10 to 12% um, if this continues. And it really is not really the choice of the manufacturer. It's really just driven by the, the cost of their goods going up. Everything from the plastic in their packaging to the labels that they print to the to the ingredients that are actually in their drinks um, to the costs of shipping um, that the you know that product to a retailer. All those things rise and all those things add up to a brand having to raise their prices and pass to the consumer. A big concern that many are talking about right now is what happens to spending when the $5.2 trillion in stimulus fades away. And here you can actually see, um, you know, the, the, the different types of stimul stimulus that's been, um, you know, imparted onto the economy. There is still one major bill that's trying to get passed through, a Build Back Better uh, bill. We don't know if that's going to be passed. Uh, the Biden administration had hoped to be able to pass that by the end of 2021. It was unsuccessful in doing so. And now it's continuing to try to push that through. But every time we saw a stimulus surge to the consumer, you start to see the rising price of a lot of different commodities, whether it was the rising price of cryptocurrencies. We saw that whole Robin Hood, um, you know, boom on everyday consumers trading stocks, which, uh, you know, generated massive high, really, um, you know, pricing on stocks like GameStop, which were really not associated with the reality in terms of the actual value of the business. But people had so much money to spend, baseball cards, stamps, collectibles, now NFTs, all these things have gone up in pricing because consumers have gotten so much money and they want to put it somewhere. And when consumers need places to put money, they put it in places that they enjoy, and that rises the cost of that. So that, to me, has always been an indicator of things to come. Um, a quarter of Americans expect their financial situation to be worse in 2022, again, as a result of the mixture of the rising prices and, and the stimulus um, slowly um, being ramped down uh, by the U.S. Uh, government. You know, the U.S. government is in a tough spot right now because we um, are the biggest holders of our own debt, meaning if we raise interest rates, we actually, the government itself has to service its own debt to other countries. So the higher interest rates become for American consumers, the higher the interest rates become for the American government who has to service its debt to other nations. So it really is in between a rock and a hard place in terms of how fast it wants to ramp up um, you know, these interest rates, which again is the ultimate arbiter of pricing uh, for consumers. One in six uh, consumers are concerned about whether they'll be able to afford basic necessities with rising prices. So, you know, that that's when you start to get fearful a little bit for some for the for the consumers in a lower socioeconomic, um, you know, situation where ultimately they're worried, can I even afford my my day to day items, my basic necessities with these prices going up? Because many Americans still have to kind of piece together paycheck by paycheck to be able to survive and take care of their family. Um it is also an impact on health and healthy eating. The pandemic has made it even harder for one in three Americans to obtain healthy, affordable food. You know, you have consumers that are living in places where it's it's you know too far away for them to go to a grocery store with healthy food, or they can't really afford it. So they're going to fast food uh, locations, which are less healthy, which is not helping the obesity crisis that um, really has ravaged um, America over the last couple of decades. The top four basic necessities that people worry about with raising prices are really commensurate with where prices have gone up to date, food and gasoline and utilities, but also medicine. Consumers are concerned, will they be able to afford their, their medicine and pharmaceuticals that they need um, on a monthly basis um, as these prices increase? 
And of course, gas prices, uh, $4 gas could be here by Memorial Day. Um, gas prices not only obviously impact the price of going on a road trip or driving somewhere, but will ultimately drive big increases in the cost of flights. So you look at the cost of international travel. Uh, we went through a period um, in the 2010s and, the, and, and, you know, and even more recently where traveling internationally was almost like a rite of passage for millennials and Gen Z, where it was three, four hundred hours to fly to Western Europe, to Italy or to Spain or to London uh, for the weekend, because you could do that. You could jump on a travel site like Kayak and access um, cheap tickets you know, internationally. But two things are going to make that highly unlikely moving forward. One is that business travel, especially international business travel, has really come grinding to a halt. We saw that with CES, where so many companies backed out having a presence at CES. That's going to happen at conferences all year long, where companies are really starting to relook at their travel and entertainment budgets and say, do I really need to send people overseas for that meeting in a Zoom-based world or to that conference? So when there's less you know, companies and corporate travel subsidizing uh, consumer travel, you know, corporate travel, business class seats subsidize the the ability for consumers to travel more cheaply on international flights. You're going to have the cost go up. On top of that, those rising cost of fuel. So those two things combined are going to be passed on to the consumer in a massive way, and expect to see incredibly high increases in international travel in 2022, um, which obviously is going to have a whole other chain of effects on consumers. Uh, so does inflation and consumer concerns uh, signal the economy in trouble? Well, you'd think so. But at the same time, we sort of have a dichotomy going on in the U.S. because we are still seeing and we'll see for quite some time the positive impacts of the stimulus on the U.S. population. Um, first and foremost, uh, employment. U.S. unemployment claims um, are at a 52-year low. Right now, there are more open jobs in the United States than there, more, than there are unemployed people. So there is work for everybody right now. It might not seem like it for everybody. And some people might say, yeah, but I've tried. I can't get a job. Okay. But for the most part, you know, consumers should not have a concern about their ability to be gainfully um, employed based upon uh, the, the record low unemployment claims and the record high um, unfilled jobs that are happening in almost every sector. So that's a good thing, right? Because in a real bad economy, it's hard to find work. And that's certainly not the case um, right now. Um, wages have jumped by the most that we've seen dating back 20 years. So not only is unemployment low, but we're seeing rising wages. And if wages rise commensurate to the level of inflation, then it's all relative. If things cost 10% more, but you your salary is 10% higher, well, then you're not really feeling the impact of inflation. And, and thankfully, we're starting to see massive increases in minimum wages. Uh, many companies, including uh, Walmart and Amazon, have really become leaders in raise, raising the minimum uh, wages. Because what we start to see at the very beginning of the stimulus is it became incredibly hard for uh, some companies to be able to staff their business, to have waiters, to have um, barbacks, to have people, um, you know, uh, short order cooks, whatever it may be. It was very hard for these companies to operate because the stimulus was so much that in some instances, it made more sense for consumers to sit home than it did for them to come into work. But now you see the minimum wage going up, which is getting consumers out of the house and back to work, which is ultimately um, a good thing. And with all that, we're seeing consumer confidence rise. Uh, I saw a, a story yesterday showing that despite all the issues we saw with supply chain this past holiday season, you still saw sales rise 8% last holiday season. So, you know, consumers still feel confident about the economy. So consumer confidence, record low, unemployment, rising wages, those are all signals of a very booming economy. Um, so again, that's juxtaposed against these rising costs on the other side. Now, if these things start to fade, right, if the impact of the stimulus starts to go away and all of a sudden, you know, unemployment starts to tick up, consumers become less confident, they stop spending while we have rising costs, then you enter a period called stagflation. Um, and, and, and nations like Japan went through that and saw, you know, a 20 year period of stagnant growth because of that you have to watch out for that, right? You, so that's, that, that's the negative side. The optimist says, you know what? 
consumers are confident. They have rising wages. You know, America is, is, the, is still the leader. Uh, we're going to get through this. So who really knows what's going to happen? There's always also externalities that we don't expect, natural disasters, war, things that can happen. God forbid another um, huge surge of, of, of COVID-19. All those things that obviously have an impact on where we're going to go uh, moving forward. So uh, what are consumers' plans? What are consumers planning given all this um, heading into the year? Uh, some want to get ahead of inflation. So when we talked to our panel, we saw things like, um, you know, consumers want to stock up on pantry supplies. Um, consumers want to buy a car now because they have record low interest rates. Financing is still low. Even though it's raised, you can still finance a vehicle or finance a home at a level much lower than you could five to 10 years ago. So some consumers kind of want to get ahead of it, whether, you know, pulling up some more higher ticket purchases now like homes and, and vehicles um, or stocking up on products just in case that there's price increases, which is really interesting. Um, we're seeing Manhattan luxury home sales skyrocket um, every month you see. A, and, and that to me is shocking because we went through a period and we had many webinars about it where we had this whole theme where millennials are flocking away from cities and they're going to more uh, rural locations. And maybe they are. Maybe it's just families with kids in school. But regardless, luxury home sales in Manhattan are through the roof. Now, this is an impact. Uh, it, you know, it's a byproduct of really the stimulus. It's a byproduct of very low interest rates where consumers can afford more because they're, they're, it's cost less to service their mortgage. So as mortgage rates go up, maybe that will put pressure um, on these uh, on these home prices. But then again, if inflation goes up, the cost of everything goes up, including the cost of things like lumber and construction. So you know, uh, the, the cost of homes could continue to go up, which could make the purchase of a first, first home for men, many families unattainable. So real estate is one where there's just so many conflating factors right now. It's really hard to understand when the right time to buy, when the right time to sell is um, in the market. Um, you still have consumers that are pushing off big purchases. Um, you know, you see consumers saying, I'm delaying buying electronics because the prices have gone too much. Um, I'm looking to buy a new car, but I'm waiting. Um, you know, we saw over the last year the cost of used cars in some instances outpace or become more expensive than their same counterpart new car. So in other words, a used Toyota Camry was more expensive than a new, new Toyota Camry because they just weren't on the showroom floor. Uh, because we saw things like the shortage of chips, uh, microchips, which made it harder for many automotive companies to produce uh, on time new vehicles, which basically left consumers no choice but to turn to used vehicles. So even in buying a car, when is the right time? Or you know, are we going to be flooded with new inventory um, now that the chip shortage has eased up a little bit? Um, or are we going to be looking at rising co costs for these new vehicles, which means that you should buy a used car now? Again, there's no really right answer for it. It's something that consumers are really struggling with trying to figure out. So um, it used to be mostly gasoline, but now other categories are really seeing inelastic demand. You know, the top product categories consumers are always going to buy from in terms of the preferred brand are personal care and pet food, meaning that regardless of the, the increase in price, brands that are in the personal care and pet food space have the most elasticity meaning they have the ability to be able to push their prices up further and further because they have very strong brand equity. So look at um, you know shaving products or shampoo or skincare products, or again, pet food. For whatever reason, consumers trust those brands. They don't want to mess with those brands. Maybe because your dog doesn't have the ability to tell you that, that he or she doesn't like the food. And if the dog's been eating the same pet food brand for the last 10 years, you know that the dog does like the food. So even if it's more expensive, why mess with it? You don't want an unhappy dog. So as a result, um, you know, consumers are sticking with these brands, like it or not, even if the prices go up. Um, so it's interesting to understand, um, you know, what products have that elasticity and the ability and you see personal care and Procter and Gamble is in the personal care space, you know, they had the ability to be able to increase their prices, uh, because they had to without it really impacting, uh, their sales. Um, we asked consumers, what are the top brands are going to keep buying despite inflation? And it's the lifestyle brands. It's the most loved brands. You're talking about brands like Nike, Adidas, 
obviously Apple, Samsung. Consumers are likely not going to switch from an iPhone to an Android device um, or another third-party uh, phone manufacturer with rising costs because they're kind of locked into that ecosystem. So Apple, I would imagine, is another brand that has a lot of price elasticity as well. Um, Nike, for example, just notched its highest quarterly sales in 50 years. So this is a lifestyle brand that made a very courageous decision um, a couple of years ago to go direct to consumer and not sell their products um, on Amazon the way they used to, really leaning into the power of their brand. Sports and sports culture is hotter than ever before. And we're seeing that in the price of um, you know sports-driven NFTs and, and sports cards and all those things and, and sports gambling and betting. Um, so because of that, Nike is really at the center of that. And they're a company, again, that has a ton of elasticity with their brand and power in their brand. So if you know consumer prices keep increasing, how are people going to save? Uh, first and foremost, some consumers said they're going to change where they shop. Uh, so one consumer said, I've started to shop at Walmart more often. Uh, some clothes there uh, are just the same, but they're cheaper. So why wouldn't I go there? Um, you know, Dollar Tree, the dollar stores um, do really well, um, if nothing else, but because of their positioning, consumers have the perception that they can go to a dollar store and be able to get, um, you know, things that products that they trust at a, at a price that is not going to jump. Uh, this was an article from mid last year where nearly one in three new stores opening in the U.S. was a dollar general. It's a shocking figure. I had to read that twice to make sure it was true. That shows how much demand there are, you know, for some of these discount stores uh, in the face of rising costs of everyday items. Um, if prices continue to rise, what are consumers going to give up? And we talked about that earlier in terms of if the price of the things they have to have go up, then they may have to give up the things that they want to have. And those three areas are restaurants and takeout, uh, meaning consumers are going to cook more at home which is something we certainly saw during the pandemic. Vacations, uh, which is a, you know kind of a very high ticket discretionary purchase uh, and new clothing. And you see all these secondhand marketplaces like Poshmark uh, that are doing incredibly well where consumers are buying and selling secondhand clothing. Uh, you know, I think companies like eBay are gonna do incredibly well when you look at the rising costs of products, right? On one hand, and you look at um, the lack of inventory and availability to supply chain issues, many consumers might say, okay, I'm going to get secondhand products on eBay for a variety of different purchases. And I think that's going to continue uh, moving forward. So, you know, people are definitely seeing this at the restaurant. Um, they're seeing, uh, you know, restaurant prices rise 8% year over year. You sit down in the restaurant, and all of a sudden you're seeing a burger that used to cost $15, cost $20. And, you know, it's hitting consumers and may make them think twice about going back to a restaurant. Um, if inflation continues to rise, restaurants and resorts might see hesitant consumers, but again, pets and personal care might be safe. So let's talk last about the tools consumers are using before we bring in our guests. Um, one in two people have used a coupon or discount service in the past three months. So with rising prices, seeking out discounts, discount codes, offers are more important than ever before. Um, so you're seeing more and more consumers seek out um, these sort of uh, discounts. Uh, Costco is offering new perks to to club members to bring them in to get them to buy bulk and trying to take advantage of the fact that they are offering products, albeit in bulk, at lower prices to help you fight inflation. Um, and people are also adopting new type of technology. So uh, tools like Honey, you know, digital coupon software, tools like Lolly, which are cashback software, which give you Bitcoin for every purchase are two tools that have been very popular um, as of late. Um, and there's so many you know, cash back and, 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 and new discount tools available to the consumers where it essentially searches the web um, instantly for any product you want to purchase to make sure you are buying the lowest, uh, the product at the lowest possible cost. Credit cards have continued to um, increase in usage. 65% of consumers have used credit cards, um, obviously, in the last three months. Um, inflation allows borrowers to pay lenders back with money worth less than it was when it was originally borrowed. So, you know, the borrowers are obviously want to lend as much as possible right now. Uh, they benefit from, from this and uh, they, you know, they want to be able to lock this in um, right now. Um, you know, Americans are starting to pay down their high interest debt on one front because they had, you know, all this discretionary expenditures from the stimulus, but at the same time, they're starting to veer more and more towards credit cards now as pricing, um, you know, goes up. So you're going to start to see maybe a rebound in the overall debt as, um, you know, balances that consumers have on an everyday basis. Uh, we have started to see a major 
rise of a new class of finance tools uh, for consumers in a category called buy now, pay later. Um, three of the leaders in this space uh, were Afterpay, Klarna, and Affirm. We had a special guest from Affirm on a prior webinar we had um, about financial service tools. And what these tools allow consumers to do is when you purchase a product, and it used to be a high ticket item like a Peloton. Um, Peloton's famous for partnering with the firm where almost nobody would pay the $3,500 for a Peloton when that was sort of all the rage during the pandemic. Everyone paid $50 a month and financed it because it was built into the purchasing process at a very low interest rate through Peloton. Um, and now you're starting to see a firm pop up on Amazon and, 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 and there are other tools. So many consumers are starting to push off payments. The question is, is that going to be going to be something that consumers uh, that bites them down the line? Um, you know, consumers have to be careful about racking up too much debt on every purchase because these are longer term payment plans for products. And while it might see, uh, seem cheap on a case by case basis, all of a sudden consumers might find themselves um, in a little bit of trouble. But right now, at least with the low interest rates, consumers are continuing to um, you know gravitate towards these products. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up and bring in our guests, unemployment's down, salaries are up. So we have consumer confidence up and that's sort of the juxt juxtaposition right now that are allowing consumers to feel a little bit easier about this rising inflation. Um, if inflation continues to rise, we, we could see some discretionary um, purchases like restaurants and travel, uh, you know, get hit. But pets and personal care and some of the more loyal brands and everyday necessities uh, may be safe for the time being. And consumers are still going to um, be very price sensitive and more than ever look to tools uh, like coupon software or buy now pay later tools to allow them to kind of um, defend against the, the cost of rising prices. So with that, I'm really excited to bring on special guests, uh, Mark Recton, who is the director of insights and sales planning at Kilbasa Smoked Meats and Brad Thompson president of Synthesis Revenue Management. So uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, two people who I regard as experts in the topic that we talked about today. Uh, I'd love to just get a little bit of background from each of you, uh, first with Mark, uh, in terms of what you do at Kielbasa um, and your background. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the webinar today. This is awesome. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been in the business for 30 years. Can't believe it's been that long, um, but I've spent time in sales, first part of my career, category management, uh, sales planning opportunities there, and then uh, Shopper Insights. So I've done a lot of big data and I've seen a lot of things over the years, which I think gives me you know pretty good 360 perspective on the industry. At, at Kilbasa, I've been here about three years and um, it's been great being with a small company. Uh, I had the opportunity to set up the insights department from the the ground up and build something, you know, from scratch, which was really awesome. They gave me a lot of latitude to do that. Um, so it positioned us to track our brand and kind of understand what was going on um, when COVID hit. Was, so it was very timely that we did that when we did so that we knew our brand position then and, and what it is you know, going forward. We kind of measured the changes. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, this summer, they added the sales planning responsibility to me. So with all the things going on with pricing and promotion changes because of the, the, the situation we're in, we really needed to tighten that down. And, and I had some experience there. So I've kind of got that dual title now being a small company and uh, helping with insights and kind of a pricing promotion. But uh, it's been it's been a great, uh, great three years with Kibasa. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us today and looking forward to hearing Thank more you. about uh, what you're working on. Brad, how about you? Hey, Matt, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, definitely a topic close to my heart. Uh, inflation and pricing, corollaries, uh, peas in a pod. Uh, so I started my career at American Express. I was head of global pricing there. Then I went to uh, GE. I was chief pricing leader at GE. And then I priced beer for Anheuser-Busch InBev uh, for many of their big markets. And now I'm president of Synthesis Revenue Management. We service mid-market predominantly private equity portfolio companies, but help them with their pricing and their data analysis. Great. Well, it seems like your background is perfect for the discussion today. Um, so, uh, Mark, we're going to start with you. You obviously work for a family-owned company. Um, you know, how's, 
how does this affect your pricing strategy when it comes to increases? You don't work for one of those huge corporate behemoths. Right. So I imagine these decisions, you, you know, you take your company takes in a very highly regarded way. So would love to hear kind of the process you go through with your company when you starting to think about how to respond to all these externalities. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, a small company is a lot different than a large company. Uh, and I've been, I've been at both. Uh, but we don't really, you know, we have one product line, so we don't have the luxury of like a, a big line of credit with a bank that we can lean on or, you know, this other product line that's doing real well that can subsidize in you know, our sausage business. So we're really uh, we're subjective to these prices in increases and, and we've seen, you know, meat alone go up 50 percent on our input. So I'm just massive uh, wall of costs coming at us and we have we're forced to pass those along. I mean, we can't, uh, you know, dally along and wait and see. Um, or, you know, we're going to, we're going to be out of business. So uh, that that's one thing. The other thing is, is, you know, the owner gets to really call the shots at some level. So he's right. uh, very much against value engineering. Uh, we're not going to change the quality of our product. That's how we build our business. Uh, so we're not going to cheapen the product. You know, he's got a saying that the quality is remembered long after the price is forgotten. So that we've been talking about that for years. So that's kind of a North star for us. Um, and so really what we've done is focused on, you know, on time and full giving our, our customers legendary customer service and really trying to take care of them um, and, and keep product on the shelf. So as we kind of think about it, you know, it's a relatively simple concept, but you, no matter what the price is on the shelf, you can't sell anything if it's not on the shelf. Right. It has to be on the shelf to even make a sale. So that's really been our laser focus and pricing kind of does what it does. And we, we try to pass that along, you know, uh, as quickly as we can and, and just hold our financials together. We're not trying to, to make money on it. We're just, we're trying to you know stay afloat, stay yep. even. Yeah, makes sense. So, Brad, you know, we we saw during the presentation that our survey respondents were concerned about the cost of everyday necessities going up. So, like knowing what you know about pricing and and given your experience, what advice would you give the consumers about these concerns? Right. Well, uh, I think there's there's two sides of it, right? And uh, like you talked about in the presentation, that uh, there's the spending side, how can I get more for less? And there's the income side. How can I, how can I get my income up to uh, match the, the costs that I'm seeing out there? I think that the income side is, is in some ways more interesting. If you think about the 7% inflation, if you're going into your annual review and there's been 7% inflation, uh, basically, your salary is now worth 7% less. So the question is, should you ask for a 7% raise? Well, that only catches you up. And then next year, if inflation continues abound, you're behind again. So I would say, hey, I'm down 7%. I expect to be down 7% next year as well. So let's take the 7 plus uh, mid-year of the incremental 7. How about a 10% increase? Right. So I think that's one way. If you can keep your salary growing at the level of inflation, the per, your discretionary purchases aren't necessarily impacted. Uh, on the buy side, I think, you know, as you talked about, uh, retailer choice, brand choice. And I think that uh, many in our audience are thinking about brand choice and how it impacts their brands. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think it's the mid-level brands that are most heavily impacted. You know, market, kielbasa, those premium brands tend to be more price insensitive. And the brands at the lowest end of the market, when people trade down, that's where they trade down right. to. The bar, I often talk about the barbell economy. It's exactly where you're going now, right? It's yeah. luxury exactly. side or value side. That's where you want to be. The middle guys are really squeezed. And that's where, you know, you really have to be creative and think it uh think about creative solutions but it's it it just shows you're better at one end or the other than in the middle right and in terms of and this is really for both of you but when when it comes to companies deciding what they can really get away with right because this is what it's about ultimately it's you're playing a little bit of a game of chicken where you want to incrementalize your costs up some companies i would imagine are doing it like mark said which his company is doing it just so they can kind of stay afloat right but other companies are being opportunistic, I'm sure, and looking at this as an opportunity to maybe increase their margins. How do companies go about the process? And we could start with you, Brad, on on how knowing where that line is 
on, on how do they know they're not pushing it too far or how do they know that they're not being, um, you know, a little bit too conservative with their pricing? Right. Well, you know, raising prices is always difficult for companies. P people would, you know, if the concerns about losing share, losing volume, plant capacity, it's always a concern. But I think the question is in this kind of inflationary environment, if not now, when? Right. So I think those concerns are real and they're valid, but people really have to take a step forward. You can't let your input costs uh, uh, accelerate faster than your prices. Right. Yeah. I think the other, okay. I think the other key thing is, is the competition. Um, right. Say your competition. I saw a, a comment in the chat that uh, my comment, my competition is raising prices. Boy, can I hold my prices flat now and get that incremental volume by increasing the price gap? I would say think about the competitive response. Now is the time that you want to uh, provide support to the pricing in your marketplace. If your competitors raise prices, raise price with them. Think about right. it if you, play, if you played it as a war game. And if you hold your prices down, competition raises their prices and loses volume, what are they going to do? They're not right. just going to lose the volume. They will probably drop back to you. So look, there's lots of ways to grow share, lots of ways to grow volume. But this, in this inflationary environment, using price to, to grow volume is not a good choice. Interesting. And, you know, Mark, when you when your company goes through these discussions, how much does the consumer play a role in terms of the input, in terms of what's going to fly with the consumer, what isn't, both in terms of the actual price and, and the positioning? Yeah, well, first of all, I agree with everything Brad says. Mm -hmm. um, makes total sense. You know, if you're not going to take price now, uh, when when would you? Sure. And, you know, we we found that, you know, our customers understand. And if you just have truthful, honest conversations with people that, that uh, they'll have truthful, honest conversations with you back. Um, but, you know, you can talk to the consumer in several ways. I mean, you can use big data and see in aggregate what the numbers say. So, I, you know, I think having um, we, had, we had run an elasticity study with Nielsen and we ran one post uh, our pre COVID post COVID. And we, we found out that, hey, we had pretty inelastic means we have you know, pretty good pricing power before yep. COVID, but it even got more inelastic uh, post COVID. So Why that gives you some courage. Just, uh, you know, availability on the shelf. Um, mm. uh, just, yeah, we, we think people, you know, like the brand. Uh, we hope that that's part of it. But I think uh, maybe Mark, consumers cooking in more too. I'm sure that had um, a positive impact on your business. And, and you know, when you, it, it's not only relative in my mind to the category, but it's relative to what's the trade off. So if I'm not eating out as much, you know, you can go out and drop $60, $70 easy on one meal. Right. And if you spend $60 or $70 on, on, on smoked sausage, you'd have, you know, three months worth in your refrigerator. Right. That's right. So, uh, it's all relative there, but, you know, so I think understanding the big data and those elasticity coefficients is, is really important, but, you know, we use your platform, um, you know, to talk to the consumer and we talk to them about pricing, you know, what are they doing? You know, well, they're eating out less, you know, the, uh, what do they, what would they think about if we raised our prices? And, you know, we found out things like, you know, there's only 20% that'd be somewhat to very likely to abandon the brand uh, if we raised our price to any level. And that's an extreme question, right? So that gives you some confidence and you can talk to them about why they like the brand. You know, they like the quality. They like things that are sticky. Yep. And they like things that are unique to our brand offering. So that gives us, you know, confidence too um, as, as we talk about this and think about it internally. Great. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's next and then we're going to bring on uh, my trusted colleague, Abel, who's going to um, bring up some of the great questions we got from the audience. But how long do each of you think we're going to be in this period of inflation? Is it transitory? Is it here to stay? If so, what are we looking at here? Let's start with you, Brad. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell. I could read, see what the Wall Street Journal is saying and, and the Fed is saying. I think you see some people talking about it being transitory, some being lasting. Here's my point of view. It's going to be more lasting than you might expect. Yeah. It's very it's very difficult uh, uh, once uh, businesses start raising their prices. Right now, they are behind. Typically, most businesses are their prices have not gone up as much as their input costs have. 
So they're catching up, right? So, uh, they're catching up. Some of the supply chain problems are reducing their availability. So their financials can be challenged if you're not really doing what, what you're talking about P&G doing and really keeping ahead of the curve. Uh, so I think there's going to be, it's once you understand that you can't, once businesses, even the input prices, understand that they can take price and are taking price regularly, they're not going to want to give up on that uh, very quickly, especially right. when they feel they're behind the curve, that they need to make some up. And as long as the inputs keep going up, the end consumer prices keep going up. Right. So I think, it, so I think it's just like a price war, right, is yep. the opposite side of it. It's very easy to start and very difficult to end. So yes. I think it'll last long. You know, I would not be looking for this to be uh, short term. And I would not be saying to my business, you know, inflation, these costs are going to stabilize very quickly. Let's hold our prices here. I think you've got a plan for them going forward. Mark, any additional thoughts on that? No, totally agree with that. You know, it's it's impossible to predict that. Uh, you know, when you asked the question, I thought about back uh, some, some of your surveys that you put out in March of 2020, if you think back that far. Yeah. Most people thought the pandemic was going to be over by August, right? No, true. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, good. I think that we're going to be in a similar situation here with this inflation is going to drag on longer than we would probably want or hope. Yeah. Uh, you know, but my my advice and what we've tried to do internally is, you know, you've got this volatility and you've got to deal with the volatility. So come up with strategies and tactics to deal with volatility and expect it to be there, you know, because when it drops, that's sometimes as crazy as when it goes up. So what do I do now to, to Brad's point? And and think about how, you know, how you handle pricing and as your inputs go up and down and all around and, and don't try to be fixed and static and, you know, fight it or you're just going to break. You know, you think about a, you know, something that's not flexible, it just breaks. Try to yeah. be flexible and come up with ways to deal with it would be, you know, my suggestion. Absolutely. Great. Well, super informative. And I want to I want to bring on my colleague, Abel Flint. Abel, there you go. Great to see you, Abel. Um, hey, how's it going? And Abel uh, has been fielding questions from our audience, and we've gotten a lot of good ones. So I'll turn it over to you, Abel. Yeah, I think most of the questions are going to centralize around how people should be communicating and what that means from a marketing perspective. So I think one of the first questions that we have here is that given that 45% of consumers don't understand why prices are increasing. Do you guys think that brands have a responsibility to educate consumers about why this is happening? Um, or should that be left to more of the public sector? So um, maybe I can start, maybe Matt will kick you off for this one. Yeah, I mean, I think that, and one thing we definitely saw during the pandemic is that consumers trust you know, brands and some of this more than they do the government or the local municipalities. They're leaning on brands for education and content that helps them weather these truly unprecedented times and whether it was how to respond during COVID or how to cook things at home when you were stuck at home, um, you know, consumers are going to continue to look to brands, Facebook pages or their websites or the content they're putting on YouTube to help them understand. And I think this is another opportunity for brands. You talk about the brands that have that elasticity and, and the ability to be able to um, raise prices without fearing that's going to impact their volume they can do that because they have strong brand equity, right? They've trust and the way they've earned that brand equity is through building trust and ultimately adding value to consumers' lives. And I think at any time of uncertainty and change, you have the opportunity, just like we do as individuals, as a business to build that trust. So I think the brands that do this, that do communicate, that do educate consumers about where this inflation is coming from, what it means for them, are gonna be the ones that are gonna continue to, to own that trust with the consumers and ultimately have the ability and earn the right to pass on prices to consumers without being questioned. Definitely. And Matt, have you seen one of the questions someone just asked was, have you seen specific examples of how brands have educated customers in the past or now about price increases? I know we've talked about some ways early in the pandemic that brands helped there. I personally have not seen it yet. I think it's a novel concept, but one that I think could be highly valuable. Definitely. Um, no, what, what we do and you know, to communicate to consumers is we really focus on, hey, we're not going to compromise our quality because We've got we built trust over the years, fortunately, with our kielbasa community, and they, um, you know, one of their biggest concerns is that we cheapen our product, and you know they don't want that to happen. So we just say, hey, we've got our costs are coming in, and we've got to do this, and 
Uh, but rest assured, we're not going to cheapen our quality or cheapen the product at all. You're still going to get your same kielbasa. And uh, we also, you know, do things for the community. We have a Links of Love program. So we kind of emphasize that, that we're, you know, giving back to the community and still doing that, not cutting that out. Um, those are some of the things we do. But it's it's just being truthful and honest. You know, again, just like our re when we sell to our retailers, those conversations, just be authentic and truthful and honest with your consumers. And, you know, I think people respect that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And maybe a follow-up question for you, Mark, is for those customers that are the most loyal to, to your product, um, who are feeling kind of the pinches of pricing, are there ways that you're communicating with them, even though you know that um, they might be having some difficulties, but still really are loyal to your product? Uh, I'm not necessarily heard of that. You know, we, we have a you know, Zendesk, people call in, people can email us, and we are very responsive to those comments. So, you know, uh, I, I'm i guessing that, you know, if somebody called in and really had a hard time, we'd probably just send them a, a free coupon. Uh, you know, if somebody calls in and so they didn't quite think the quality was up to snuff, you know, we um, we send people money every week, send them a you know refund back, actually double their money back uh, and say, give us another try. So, you know, we, um, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, but I suspect that's how we would handle it. Awesome. Um, one question here is that as some customers kind of personal income reduces, are we seeing the overall grocery um, shopping basket change in terms of what's in it? What are consumers putting away? Um, things like that. Uh, maybe Brad, if you have any thoughts on this question. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen the syndicated uh, data April, but, but I'm absolutely as consumers feel pinched, they will definitely change their purchasing behavior, right? So they'll definitely move to more of the necessities, uh, less of the the treats in their basket, right? Uh, and as as Matt was talking about, but there are uh, there are some brands where you've got the higher brand equity, and uh, where like personal products, you don't want to have a, a private label toothpaste, right? Um, so there's unless, you, unless that's all you can afford, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, so the consumers choose where they save. And the, the, the key for brands is this is when your brand equity really shows itself, True. how you built it. If you are getting a lot of trade down uh, for small price gaps, uh, you're going to see that your, your brand equity may not have the value that you, that you thought it had. Or... When there's uh, when your competition, uh, you take price and your competition doesn't take price and your volume holds up, you may realize that your brand equity is stronger than you perceived. Um, so you, I think the key is that you continue to test and look at the data uh, in your own brands to 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 see how these when the consumer changes how uh, the impact of your brand equity, uh, your package size mix, et cetera, uh, is changing and be very responsive. You've just got to keep your finger on it. You know, looking at that data from uh, a year ago and assuming things have not changed, uh, that is not where we are. Right. Definitely. And maybe one final question for me all from the audience, but um, just across from what you guys understand now about uh, inflation, what are what have been the most surprising goods that you see are a little bit more elastic than maybe you would have uh, would have thought um, there? And maybe I can start with Mark for, with you on that one. A little more elastic. Um, gosh, I. You know, I think back to what Matt said, I think it's just the, the dis more discretionary things are, are going to be more more elastic and, and the, you know, the things that you, you absolutely have to need are going to be more elastic. I think um, probably the biggest surprise to me would be that, you know, people are kind of give up restaurants and they went back home and learned to cook. You know, that's yep. um, that almost probably took a lockdown for that to happen. But, I'm you know, through my entire career, I've been in the retail side of things, not in food service and food service has always been the winner. I mean, I've been in a declining business my entire career and all of a sudden it flipped and you know i, I just never anticipated that people would um you know would stop eating out and there's, there's a lot of drivers to that mark not only i mean you have the pandemic obviously which was the big catalyst but the byproduct of that is 
many companies have gone remote and you know yep. even institutions that said they'd never go remote like the big financial institutions here in new york where i am are still remote and when people are home now they're making their lunch at home they're not going out and they're not they're going to less business dinners and again they're traveling internationally less they're traveling domestically less so for all those reasons even with you know in times in this country we've seen over the last two years where you can go to restaurants safely you still see consumers who've gravitated towards a more healthy in some ways more economic an economical lifestyle of eating at home sticking to that yeah it's um, not that much fun to go out to lunch by yourself and right uh, right and they not, to get, their not to get in my my uh you know my my health but i don't eat i don't consider myself eating super well but i mean my cholesterol is down like 50 60 points over there two years ago just by eating less at restaurants and there you go you know, it makes me say well do i want to go back and do that like right. i was you know and I think it's funny some of the things that are inelastic. Like I would have never thought of uh, pet food as inelastic. Right. That that was right. surprising to me too. Right. Although premium products, I, that, you know, pet food has moved more towards uh, premium brands. And I think those premium brands in a time of pandemic, when people are looking to treat themselves and give themselves uh, something extra, that those kind of brands can see uh, growth even in challenging economic times. And the other one is cars, right? Um, I've never uh, seen fewer ads for car promotions than this yep. year. And I, I know supply is down, but but really given the, the pricing power of both new and used cars, uh, that surprised me. Yeah, I mean, Ford stock is at an all time high. Again, if people are going to be less likely to travel internationally, they're, more, they're going to be more likely to travel domestically. They're going to do so in their vehicle. That's why we're seeing Airbnb do so well. So there's just a lot of factors that drive to much more demand in the automotive space than we ever thought we'd get again in a world of Uber. A couple of years ago, we thought that people didn't want vehicles at all, but now it's reversed. So a lot has changed in a very short period of time, and it definitely seems with inflation, things are going to continue to change in some ways change is going to be the only constant. So um, I want to thank uh, both of you, Mark and Brad, for joining uh, the webinar today. It was really fascinating. It's a topic that I could talk about all day because we just th there's so many twists and turns to the economy right now and ultimately the consumer. And it really goes across all sectors. And we're going to be sure, Susie, to make sure we do everything we can to help our community be able to navigate through all this. So uh, thank, thank both of you, you for joining. Abel, thanks so much for all the work you and uh, Katie Robinson have done on the webinar today. And thanks to our audience for joining. So on behalf of myself and our entire team at Suzy, we want to wish everyone a belated Happy New Year. Uh, we're going to be doing these every month this year in 2022 with some amazing topics um, and guests like we had today. So until then, uh, wishing everyone uh, to be safe and happy and joyous in 2022. And we'll see you really soon. So take care, everyone. Until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Matt.